So I'll start by introducing myself, Chris Eigner. I'm the president for the Long Island chapter of Trout Unlimited. Uh, I spend a lot of time um, thinking about trout. I got into this through fly fishing. That's how I started it. And uh, I grew up backpacking, hiking, spending a lot of time outdoors. And uh, I fell into it. And now I spend more time doing conservation work than I do fishing. So uh, to talk about Trout Unlimited really quickly, it's a national organization. It's a not-for-profit started in Michigan. Uh, 400 chapters, it tends to be grassroots, local chapters that are doing local projects. Um, our chapter at the bottom has 450 members, Long Island chapter, that's mine. Art Flick is the Eastern Suffolk chapter, has 250 members. Um, the agenda is basically to protect rivers, um, both headwaters and further down, native and wild populations uh, with a concentration in salmon and trout, which are cold water fish. Here is the brook trout. This is a, one of the most beautiful freshwater fish that exists. Uh, even amongst trout, it's recognized as one of the most beautiful. You could see the, the bright white fins, the edge of the fins, and those, uh, those inverted colors versus the brown trout. And this guy's probably close to spawning season. They tend to get brighter and orange belly during the spawning season. And they're beautiful fish. They are the least tolerant of the various trout species in terms of um, water heating up and water clarity and pollution. They really, you need cold, clean water for the brook trout to survive and to thrive. Um, it's the only native trout species we have in Long Island. Again, one of the reasons it's so important. Uh, it's part of the char family. It still falls under um, trout. It's a salmonid. Uh, it spawns in the fall. Looks for small gravel about the size of its um, eggs to spawn. Uh, usually, this is up in the headwaters of rivers. Uh, we'll talk about that a little more. But we do have naturally reproducing populations in Long Island. Um, they're primarily river dwelling. And then I'll say in the end, something that's unusual about our brook trout out here in Long Island and in Massachusetts, um, basically all along the coast, is we have strains that ad have adapted to going out into the salt water. So depending on the weather and the conditions, some of these fish are going out into the salt and eating in the bays and then coming back in to spawn. OK, a little history of Long Island. And in case you haven't seen this map before, this is um, various watershed zones. Uh, I'll, I'll break it down a later slide. So pre-industrial Long Island. Here are two excerpts from American Turf Register and Sports Magazine, 1839. 1839. Fly fishing commences earlier on Long Island than in other of the frozen north regions. It's acknowledged by all hands that there are few sections of the country where this delightful recreation may enjoy, be enjoyed to greater perfection. The streams take their rise at the foot of the ridge, which divides the island from end to end. They are rarely above three miles long, but while you can step across them a quarter of a mile from their sources, they are deep and wide enough for sloop navigation a mile from their mouths. So these are short rivers. Um, they grow quickly once you get, once you get close to the, the mouths. But these, the reason I include this slide is in, in 1840, Long Island was known for its fishing and its brook trout. This was a little bit of a mecca for, for fishing. We had a number of sports clubs. Um, people came here for our native trout, which was also a delicacy. Uh, it still is today. Brook trout is a delicacy um, for the table. So they talked about, does this work? Yeah. So they talked about the ridge in the last slide, the ridge and the rivers coming out from that ridge. So here are the main ridges in Long Island. Um, they were formed by glaciers many thousands of years ago. Uh, they're called moraines. So a glacier would have come down and sit, sat right here. Uh, it would have covered all of New England, actually, but there would have been a big glacier sitting 
uh, in the Long Island Sound, the terminal end, and it would have created what are called tunnel valleys. So the glaciers, uh, picture a massive glacier sitting here, a massive chunk of ice, and it would have been melting um, slowly and from the bottom. So it would have been uh, sitting on this uh, melting water, and the weight of it would pressurize it and push up that water out from underneath the glacier and form these, these valleys underneath the glacier, and it would force that sediment out, and the sediment would disperse across the southern side of the island and uh, in form of loose mixed sediment. Okay, that's the, that's the very rough overview of, of how the topography was formed. And that topography defines the watersheds. Um, here's another view of it in terms of elevation. So you see this ridge, the elevation here. OK, um, present day rivers. There are 74 non-tidal rivers in Long Island. You know, I think we, we forget about this. You know, we, we're, we're so used to seeing asphalt, I think, that we forget that these rivers still exist. Places like Manhattan, they've, they still exist. They're just covered over by streets. Out here, um, they're still open. There's 74 of them across Long Island. Uh, if you see at the top there, only four out of the 74 are unimpaired, means in their natural state, um, at least to a, a decent degree, not degraded, I should say. Um, I need to ask a question, Bill. Mm -hmm. Do you have the system in Lloyd Harbor that goes along uh, Mill Road into Hunting Harbor? Is that listed there? I'm not sure what river that is, but it should be here. Uh, I think this is pretty comprehensive, this list. Um, if you go onto longislandtu.org um, under conservation, there's a map of all the rivers in Long Island, and we're going to go to that in a later slide. And uh, you can actually zero in on that river that you're talking about, and you can get the, um, the water body index number from the DEC, and you can look up to see if it's been assessed. Okay. Um, but, you know, a lot of these rivers have been affected. Uh, Almost all the rivers in Long Island. We're a highly developed place. Um, current issues. So again, development is first on the list. We're building roads. We're building dams. A big, a big problem would be legacy industries. We were building dams on Long Island back in the 1700s. I was just talking to Chart about that. 1796, the dam uh, at Stump, Pond, Stump Pond in the Nisiquag was built. So old, old dams. When when you build the dams, you change the whole morphology of the river. You are putting a stop on the flow of sediment out into the bays. You are creating heat sinks, um, all sorts of problems with, with uh, putting up dams. Um, it gets into thermal pollution. So there's an inverse relationship between temperature and the capacity of water to hold dissolved oxygen. The colder the water, the more oxygen it contains. Um, Roughly. So as you have something called thermal pollution. So as the, the temperature of the water rises, the amount of dissolved oxygen goes down, and thereby the capacity for animals living in the water to survive. All animals need oxygen. The shellfish need oxygen. Insects need oxygen. Fish need oxygen. OK, so as we put up these dams and we impound the water in a topography like, uh, like Long Island that happens to be a very low gradient, you can put up a two-foot dam, and all of a sudden, you've got a 100-acre lake, you know, or a very large lake that's maybe three foot deep. And the sun's beating on that, and it's just basically a big, simmering hot pan. And the summer months, it, it warms up the whole river. Uh, chemical pollution, you have nitrogen um, from municipalities, from golf courses, from old septic tanks, there are industrial pollutions. These tend to lead to algae blooms and a variety of other problems. And then finally, uh, dewatering and sewering. Um, all of the rivers in Long Island basically are ground fed. Uh, there are spring creeks. That's as opposed to um, upstate or mountainous areas where you have snowpack, you have mountains. That slowly melts the, the, the 
mountains act as sponges. They slowly release that water in the spring and the summertime. In Long Island, it's constant. It comes from underground aquifers. It wells up all year long. It comes up as a constant cool temperature. But uh, you know, these are limited resources, these underground aquifers. So what you have is some towns, um, I'll give the example of Port Washington, um, I think Glen Cove. There's a number of towns that, that basically they have wells that are pulling up this water from the aquifer, and they treat it in their homes, they use it in their homes, and then they bring it to a water treatment plant, and instead of going back down to the ground, percolating down and filtering down to the aquifers again, they flush it out to the sea. So you're going to have a general lowering of water tables in that, in that instance. So uh, I mentioned just a few of the unimpaired uh, rivers. The most famous here in Long Island are the Carmens, is the Carmens, which is right, runs you know, right next door to here, uh, the Kanetquat and the Nisiquag. And these were largely preserved because they were um, effectively private fishing clubs for 100 years, you know, a very long time. Um, a lot of famous stories of catching very large brook trout here. Um, some of the others I mentioned at the bottom, the headwaters of the Carls over here, and uh, some of these tributaries in the Oyster Bay watershed. This general area, the north coast here, tends to be a little less developed. They were the old Gold Coast mansions. So some of those, um, those old estates didn't necessarily get turned into uh, modern suburbia. Some of them were, are still pretty green. So uh, some resources. Um, this gentleman had asked, this is a website. Um, this is our website, longislandtu.org. Under the conservation tab, you can get to this map. And it's basically a Google map that we have used uh, the DEC's data um, to aggregate all of the rivers on Long Island and their status according to the DEC, whether they're unimpaired, impaired, have minor impacts, if they haven't been assessed, or if they need verification and the impacts are suspected. Um, so green is the unimpaired. You can see how few there are. Uh, but this, you can click on them, you can drill down into them. Uh, it's, a visual, it's a visual tool, okay? And if you click on any of them, you can get to the uh, index number. So longislandtu.org and the conservation tab. Please use it. Um, we're giving it to the public to use as a tool, especially for citizen scientists. Here's another tool, uh, a map tool. This is the Joint Venture Brook Trout Coalition. And this is a multi-state uh, joint venture that goes from Maine to Georgia, trying to document the range of uh, native brook trout here. Um, so this map is supposed to represent watersheds that still have uh, native brook trout um, in those watersheds. This big one here that you see here, that's the Carls River. Okay? You've got Konequa, you've got Carmen's, you've got Nisiquag. Okay, uh, and then some little guys here in Oyster Bay. So ecosheds.org um, is going to be the website for this, but there's a link to it again on longislandtu.org under the conservation tab under that Long Island status map. So if you want to get to this and drill down and explore, you can go that way. DEC water body inventory. Uh, DEC has done a lot of extensive um, uh, you know, assessing of all these, of the harbors, of the rivers, the bays. So um, they've done a lot of work um, outlining the problems and the impacts. So, you know, if you go to dec.ny.gov, um, again, this link is on our website. Uh, you can drill down by um, water body. If you have a river nearby that you're interested in, this is a good place to start. Okay, this is an interesting thing. So we, we spoke in the beginning about this, these moraines that divide Long Island. So this is um, the United States Geological Society's uh, hydrology data set. These are watersheds. So you can see here this, this uh, dark yellow line. There's the moraine that you saw on the map. There's that high altitude. And just like a continental uh, divide, if a drop of rain lands here, it's going to through gravity, work its way out uh, through this watershed. If a drop of water ends up right here, a 
few feet on the other side, it's going to work its way out this watershed. Um, so these lines are dividing major and minor watersheds, um, and they're going to help you when you're, you know, when you're in an area to know what river system you're in. Okay, uh, this is what I try to explain to people in Long Island especially. It's not just about trout. Trout is just a signature species that represents the purity and uh, the health of the rivers. Um, but the rivers, especially on Long Island, affect everything. They are our circulatory system. They're the lifeblood of Long Island. Um, I explained already that keeping that cool temperature is keeping the oxygen up in the river. Well, it's not just for the river. That oxygen ends up flowing right out into the bays, and they become the lungs of the bays. The shellfish feed off that fresh oxygen, um, the crustaceans, everything's feeding off this fresh supply of oxygen that's constantly flowing into the rivers. Now, if you put a dam up 20 feet before that, uh, that outlet into the bay, and you let it heat up in the sun, right? You create a big heat sink, a big pond, all of a sudden that oxygen drops and now this river that was once the lungs of the bay is now has no oxygen in it. So very important um, and that has a ripple effect obviously. What feeds on the shellfish or the crustaceans are the larger animals, the birds. Um, rivers are effectively sediment movers. So you have, we live in a forest zone, the trees are dropping their leaves in the fall, they're decomposing that's all this new sediments being produced. That sediment has to be brought somewhere, um, and the rivers do a lot of that. The rivers are, are helping to flush this sediment out into the oceans, and that includes uh, nutrients, it includes the animals that live off the microbiotica and the larger animals that live off of those, um, those nutrients, and that's also getting flushed out into the bays and, and being foraged upon. Um, you have a lot of small fish that breed in the rivers, and you have turtles, frogs, salamanders, and then um, some larger anadromous fish. The alewives are very famous right now. There are a lot of fish ladders being put in for alewives across Long Island. These are fish that are going out into the ocean, but they need to spawn in the freshwater. Um, so not just, not just important to trout. Techniques and methods, so the point of the point of this uh, presentation is to talk about what, what can be done. You know, these rivers have been degraded over the course of 300 years. It's been a very long time period that they've been consistently degraded. In the 70s, the environmental movement popped up, right? And now we're in 2.0. We're in a new phase of environmentalism brought on by global warming. Um, so it took 300 years to degrade. You know, these things aren't going to get fixed overnight. We have to start thinking a little more long term, and we have to start tracking some of these projects. You know, when I first got involved, there was no information, or uh, there was information, but there was, there was no um, track of where to begin and where to go, no direction. Uh, and that's what we're, we're trying to develop. So, so the first thing are the tools, you know, having an easy set of tool, an easy tool set to use. Um, some very easy things that can be done by anybody are stream cleanups. So here's my wife right here, who's sitting right over here. Um, this was a cleanup on the Carls. Uh, this is some guys from our chapter. This was a cleanup on, uh, on Alley Creek in Queens, Alley Pond Park. Culvert cleanouts, culverts are this, these are some very large culverts underneath the bridge. These are the tunnels that run under roads and bridges that allow water to flow. Uh, sometimes they get clogged. Sometimes there are divots that break fish passage. Uh, fish stockings, you know, this is relatively benign as long as the DEC will allow you to do it. Um, and streamside plantings. DEC cares a lot more about you taking a tree out than putting a tree in. So. You know, as long as you're making an effort to promote native trees, putting trees alongside the banks are very valuable. You can see here how the trees are hanging over. This is all shade uh, to prevent that thermal pollution and, and habitat protection from predators. Uh, medium difficulty. So this is called a revetment. This is, uh, this is the bank right here. And what you're doing here is you're, you're embedding brush it can be brush, 
um, debris. It could be conifers, uh, you know, Christmas trees. You see down here at the profile view. Um, and you're basically giving the river some tools for it to rebuild itself. So this is basically going to be uh, a mechanism to slow down the energy of the river. And remember I said that rivers are sediment movers. They're going to be charged with sediment, especially during high flows. And once it hits this barrier, these barriers, it's going to lose a lot of energy. And then all the sediment that's flowing around in it is basically going to drop. So it's not going to have enough energy to carry the sediment. The gravity is going to allow it to pull down. And these are going to fill in. So basically what you're trying to do is you're trying to narrow the river. You're trying to build out a bank. Uh, what's happened to a lot of the rivers over the years, they're confined. They're not allowed to. A natural progress for a river, natural progression is, is uh, starts out straight, becomes sinuous, becomes meandering, and then uh, until it's looking like a, you know, like that, then you have a high flow, and then the bends break through, and it's a straight river again. But we can't have that on Long Island, right? We wouldn't be able to have roads, paths, anything if it was totally left to its own devices. So they're confined, and um, what ends up happening is some of these banks are, uh, they slowly get, get broken away. Some of them get confined. And a lot of the rivers on Long Island have become narrow, uh, sorry, wide and shallow. Um, and you need a certain amount of depth and, uh, to, to maintain those temperatures. So it's not just this shallow pan that the sun's baking on. You also need depth for habitat. Uh, large woody debris, that would be something like this. When you see big logs falling into the river, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Some people are, think they're you know, doing good by pulling everything out of the river and making it look pristine like out of a fairy tale. Uh, but the rivers need these. During high flows, water comes through, hits this barrier, and is forced downward, and it creates these gouge pools. Um, and those pools filled with water, fill with water and stay cooler uh, during the hot summer months and become a valuable refuge to, to fish um, and insects. Uh, In-stream structure, you can create V-dams and J-dams um, and culvert repairs. Uh, this is the really difficult stuff. This takes years to do. Uh, this is over in uh, Beaver Lake in Oyster Bay. This was recently put in. Uh, this is for alewives. They're trying, there are brook trout in this system, so they are trying to figure out whether the brook trout are going to be using this as well. Um, there's a wonderful organization called the, the, the um, geez, what's it called now? <laughs> the Salt Run Brook Trout Coalition, run out of Massachusetts, where they've reintroduced uh, wild trout into three rivers that are now salt run trout. They're going in and out, and it's well documented. Uh, so there is some hope that um, some of these Alaskan fishways, these, these steep fish ladders, are going to be used by brook trout as well. So far, so far that hasn't panned out, but we know that the alewives are using this to some success. Uh, Babylon is a good example. Um, dam removals. This is the order of the day. Dams are coming down around the country. Uh, whatever dams we can take down is going to be a benefit to the general ecosystem, not just to the fish, but across the board. Um, and finally, land preservation. You know, the, the, the easiest way to preserve is to prevent it from becoming degraded in the first place. If you have an area that's surrounded by trees next to a river, next to a pond, uh, it's turning over, maybe ownership's turning over, maybe you want to go to the town, see if we can preserve it, buy it get egress, whatever. Uh, when you do any of these things, you got to go through the DEC. Um, they're the gatekeepers. You file a joint application, Article 1524. So we're going to have all this information uh, on our website. So if you want to do a project, you can do it yourself. You can contact us and get help. We'll partner with you. Um, it's, it's, anybody can do this. It's not restricted to any organization. A uh, 20-year plan. Um, so I came into this organization. Um, let's see, 35. I came into this organization, and I found a lot of smart people with a lot of knowledge, um, a lot of rivers, and I really didn't know where to go from there. Everything was stored in people's brains. Um, projects that were done in the past were done in 
hard copy files or PDFs that were buried in people's computers. So I was really kind of moving around the dark, and I didn't know where to start, what rivers to start. Um, so I wanted to create something that people that are getting into this or are in it, uh, they know where the low-hanging fruit is. They, they can step right into a project and know what's been done and what uh, is likely to come next. So the first part is um, packaged with standard operating procedures for analyzing the rivers, for what, um, what applications to file. I had to meet with the DEC a few times to, just to understand the application process. I mean, there's a, there's a whole barrier to entry that has to do with education. And it's, they make it very easy for us, DEC. It's just that you have to know to start with, right? Um, so uh, putting these tools together in one place, um, having some kind of project management software. Right now, we're, it's basically an, an Excel table. Uh, but in the future, I'm hoping to have something a little more uh, professional where many different agencies can interact with this project management software at the same time. Um, have a meeting every year where you, you ask for feedback. You can ask for people who have boots on the ground to give their feedback on uh, what's happening in those rivers and what, what, where we can improve. And then to keep the records in a, in a central public repository. You know, not a PDF in somebody's computer, not a hard copy you know, buried in somebody's drawer, um, but something that can be, after I'm gone, someone can use it you know, and see a paper trail. So here's the, the, Jeff, the rough 20-year plan. This is the start. You can all read that, right? Uh, this is the start of it. Um, I'll read the, the columns for you. We have Alley Creek, Flag Creek, which is in Wellwyn, Beaver Brook, which is in Oyster Bay, the Oyster Bay watershed. There are five small tributaries feeding into that bay. Carl's River, Massapequa Creek, Swan River, uh, which also has brook trout in it. Uh, Kanetquat, Nisiquag, and other rivers. Um, as a matter of fact, a number of these have brook trout in them. Uh, so on the, the, the rows, what we have are by month for 12 months. Then we have a six month, a six month, a six month, a year, 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 year. And then the last two are three year periods. So this goes out 15 to 20 years. Um, and the goals get kind of vague towards the end. But obviously, in the beginning, they're very specific. You know, to have, just like project management, if you belong to an organization in your job, whatever you're trying, you have goals to achieve, this is something that is trackable. The public can see what we're doing, but they can also participate. They can help. Uh, they can see what's been done. They can pick up the baton if, if it has to be dropped. We're going to have our first baby in uh, August. So my baton's going to be put down for a while, but hopefully, you know, the project can keep rolling. Um, I'm going to break out an example. I'm going to give you three examples, three rivers here. Uh, this is Alley Creek, so Alley Pond Park. Uh, anybody from New York City here? OK, great. So this is the border of uh, Queens and Nassau. Uh, this is one of the most wild parks in the city. It's a beautiful place, uh, a lot of wetland. Um, and we are in the final stages of getting permission to restock brook trout here. Um, brook trout within the borders of New York City. It's a rare feat. Uh, TU was instrumental in doing it back in the 90s and turned out, you know, they, they did a lot of development on the roads and the, the highway systems there, so it was kind of forgotten about. Uh, but lo and behold, the, the superintendent of the park said, oh yeah, I was watching those brook trout for years. I would go by, they were so beautiful, they were that big, uh, you know, and then Hurricane Sandy happened and I didn't see him again. Well, Hurricane Sandy was 12 years after they were stopped. So we know that this is a river that can support trout. Um, you know, whether it can support uh, spawning habitat is another matter. Uh, but at the very least, for trout to be stocked and for them to survive year over year, we know it can be done here. This is also a ground-fed, spring-fed creek. So you know, constant temperatures all year long. It doesn't get too hot in the summer. It doesn't get too cold in the winter. Uh, so some of the things we've done, you know, spoke with different stakeholders, New York City Parks, DEC. Uh, we got a DEC permit for stocking. You know, 
countless emails and, uh, and phone calls, and this is just summarizing it. And the goal, stock brook trout in April, hopefully um, talk about drainage on the west branch, correct the drainage, talk about lowering the dam, uh, dam passage. You know, this is 2020, 21, so we'll reconcile it every year and hopefully make some progress. Um, Flag Creek in Wellwyn, this is a small creek that used to be on the Pratt Mansion um, estate. Uh, we electroshocked with the DEC. We found no native brook trout. It's important not to stock over natives. You know, natives are a rare and special breed if they've survived this long. These are the strong fish that will survive and that we want to propagate. Um, so you don't want to put a, a stocked fish over wild fish. So first step was ensuring that there were no wild fish in that river, which they were not. We put in data loggers. We proved to the DEC that the temperatures um, can sustain trout. And uh, we got a permit to stock it, and we did so. So now there are fingerlings in there. They've grown an inch already, and they're doing very well. So hopefully they'll continue to. Um, we already know roughly what kind of stream work we want to do. So this spring, we plan on submitting an application to the DEC and doing some work on this river. Carl's River is the fourth largest river in Long Island, fourth or the fifth. It's a pretty big uh, watershed, as you saw before. Um, this is a bigger project. Uh, there was a, a horse manure problem that was happening um, that the DEC dealt with. Um, the owner was very um, um, reasonable, I think, uh, from what I understand with that. Uh, we stocked fingerlings in the upper reaches. The DEC also stocked up there. Um, but there's plenty of room for improvement on this river, which is what we'll hope to do. The long-term projects down here, a lot of it has to do with dam removals. Hopefully, we, you know, it's a, it's, it's, it's a growing thing. You, you do little projects, you gain more stakeholders, more people interested in it, and it grows from there. And hopefully by the time we get around to removing dams, there's enough public awareness about um, the, you know, their negative impact on, on the ecology that we'll have more public support. Dams are largely about public support in a, in a place as developed as Long Island. Uh, some other rivers, Island Swamp Brook, Another river that used to have trout in it, uh, Willits Creek, Mud Creek. These are kind of sorted by rivers that we know have supported trout in the past, and they've just been extirpated. Um, but we can bring them back. Uh, we just have to think long term. You know, people. There are mud traps that are trapped in Mud Creek. That's correct. That's correct. Yep. Yep. That was. They did some fin clippings in Mud Creek, and they discovered that it was a native strain of trout there. Um, so you know, but they all need help. Every single one of them need help here. Even the even the the Carls, the Carmens, uh, I'm, the Carmens, the the Connecticut, the Nisquag, every all these rivers need help um, in Long Island. So we really have to uh, pay attention. So in conclusion, uh, please use the conservation tab of LongIslandTU.org. It's where a lot of this information is aggregated. It's where we're going to upload uh, a lot of this information for future use. Um, the goal is to begin a transparent, trackable, and buildable platform for the next 100 years. Our grandkids and their children and grandchildren will hopefully be fishing in a very different Long Island. Remember that the brook trout are a signature species for representing the health of rivers. Healthy rivers equals healthy bays equals healthy groundwater. So the goal is to think as long-term as it took to destroy these rivers, <laughs> You know, let's think long term about building them up again. It's not just uh, us, but the generations coming after us. All right, Daniel Carpenter again. Uh, brook trout were put into the Bronx River a number of years ago. Do you know what the results of that are? Uh, I don't know if it was as long ago as that. I think that I know that, that the New York chapter of TU are working on that now. They're putting a lot of energy into the Bronx River. Um, and I can't remember what the update on the project is, um, but yeah, uh, if you check out New York TU, I'm sure they have something on that. But Thanks. I know that they're working on it. Yeah, you're welcome. Uh, questions? Okay, we do have questions. Times for questions. I have a, a question. This is based on my experience on Western Long Island. When you're thinking about the dam removal, uh, 
Do you also look at the dry weather flow ahead of time? Certainly where I am, there's about an 18, 10, over 10 foot uh, drop in the water tables. It's an area that's sewered. Mm -hmm. And basically, if we don't have the dams, we don't have any water. So uh, there might be a necessary evil in some of these places where the, uh, there's drawdown. And I'm wondering if you're using that as a criteria for uh, whether you do a project or not. Well, I think that there is a difference between dams that are put there for human purposes, like uh, like a reservoir or something like that. Well, the, these were, but now we'll have to look at whether they're retained or not. Right. The removal. Right. Um, I don't know the specific example that you're talking about, but what I found I, with dams are 90% of the time when you drill down into it, uh, the, light, the, you, the, the conclusion 99% of the time is it's beneficial to take it out. Uh, you know, there are concerns. There's concerns about are we going to do away with the water entirely if we don't have the dam? Uh, there are concerns about the sediment buildup behind the dam. Is it, is, it, uh, is it toxic? Is it going to clog the river further down? Uh, it's no easy task to take down these dams, but... Um, I'm thinking about uh, East Meadowbrook, uh, uh, the, the, the area that goes through Hempstead State Park. There's a couple of dams there, mm -hmm. down to Smith Pond. Mm -hmm. uh, but these areas, basically, the, the uh, drinking water pumping has removed all the, the uh, uh, natural... Uh, upwelling and the natural uh, spring. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So they, they become, uh, and this is where I spent most of my life. And uh, yes, I can I certainly talk about how the history of the brook trout and how it's been damaged. I'd love to see them, but I don't, I don't, right. I'd, I'd, uh, I'd be skeptical that we'd lose everything. Yeah. In those I areas. mean, it, there are a lot of factors that, um, a lot of people that are stakeholders in this, people are using it for recreation. It's the, uh, the, the I'm a biologist, so I'm strictly looking at the ecosystem. Stri strictly so at I, the biology of it? Yeah. OK. Um, well, you know, I think one of the things with dams that, that uh, you got to look at, too, is um, the way these rivers are often working. In an area where you have a lower water table, it, it's a little tricky. You know, you have sewering. Mm -hmm. The water table has been reduced. The rivers have been reduced to begin with. Uh, they're smaller rivers than they would be naturally. Um, but one I, thing I will say and, and throw in there that I didn't talk about during the presentation uh, is, you know, we've we've taken away the flood control component for some of these rivers by basically keeping them, keeping the the water tables, the water the the valleys as full as possible. Uh, I know Babylon um, and the Carl's River they have a lot of problems when it does rain. And maybe it's not in the low, low flows of the peak summer, but in, say, springtime or in the wintertime. All of their valleys are filled up, and these reservoirs are filled up. And when it rains, everything floods. You know, that the floodplain is instantly accessed every time, and the town is flooded. And that's not necessarily how they're supposed to operate. Um, but it would be interesting to talk piece by piece. You know, the dam removals are always there are always many stakeholders that are going to be talking about it, scientists, uh, engineers, um, a lot of different people. And uh, to be honest, there's so few that have happened um, that I don't have a lot of experience with it. Uh, I know that the general conclusion usually is take it down. But uh, you know, as far as specific, specific experience with them, we're still so many years off, I, I really can't talk uh, to specific examples like Hempstead. I Although I, I know Hempstead has a lot of cemented in uh, pools. And so, uh, there's been a tendency to uh, end up, uh, the ones that aren't dammed and when there's no water. Uh, I've literally walked streams uh, after a rainfall, watched the water coming into the stream, and you walk a little further, and it's gone, and you dry sand again. So it just goes right down through the uh, stream bottom instead of coming up through it. Uh, so it, it, there's a real deficit of water underground, and it soaks it up like a sponge. Mm. 
Uh, and that, well, well, then people say, well, why do we have the stream at all? It's a mess. It has de debris in it. Let's put a pipe in it. So I've watched several of the streams ended up just being inside culverts on the ground. You wouldn't even know they're there. It's interesting. So that, I think that so it's a little complicated on Long Island. It absolutely is. But it's interesting. Like my first thought about that is it's such a typical human trait to, to see the water disappear and go, well, why do, why do I have this stream at all? Yeah. You know, if I don't get to enjoy the pleasure of this water, but, but it's a natural system, right, that's supposed to percolate down. But it isn't even a stream at that point. It's an open drainage ditch. All right. So it's, uh, all, right. Uh, all right, thank you. You're welcome. Sorry if I couldn't be a better help with that. Um, thank you, Chris. Uh, that was a great presentation. Uh, I learned how to fly fish on Meadowbrook as did my, I found out many years later on, as did my uh, ecology professor at St. Lawrence. He probably, I fished there in the 60s, he probably fished there in the 30s. Um, and that's a stream that Jim's describing now. It's, uh, you can walk the whole length of it. Um, but I think your point of um, Restoring some of these areas is important because the only way we're going to get the connection with the next generation is they've got to get out there and fly fish or just hike these things and see them. And we have to really start rethinking on the west end of Long Island this whole idea of the sewage treatment plant taking uh, a limited, very valuable resource, our fresh water, and piping it out into the ocean. Mm. after it's been treated. We really, I know it's complicated, but we really have to start thinking about ways that we can recharge that treated water. Um, my, my question for you, though, is um, I'm curious, can we, can we utilize the native genetic stock of some of these uh, brook trout areas that are sustaining and use that for uh, restocking? I mean, how are you dealing with that question of maintaining some of the local uh, genetic pool. Yeah, it's something, that kind of idea about moving native strains between rivers, that's something that the DEC would be intimately involved in. You know, that's, that's not a practice that has been done so often in the past, but they're starting to do that now with alewives. They bring native strains of alewives that have been successful in other areas and moving them. Um, so I think, that's in, I think that's in the future because they, you know, in places where they're reintroducing these trout, they discover that the closest to wild, the closest to native, the better their chances of reproducing, of surviving, going out into the salt. So it is something that um, we'll have to look at. I mean, there are, there are hatcheries that are using native strains, Cold Spring Harbor, Connectquat, they're using these Connectquat strains where they're grabbing uh, fish from, from the headwaters of Connectquat, for instance, uh, that are supposed to be native uh, fish. Uh, but as far as, you know, transplanting them, I get a feeling that it might be in the future, but that's really DEC will be very closely involved if that ever happens. Uh, I will say also to the first point where you talked about sewering and flushing it out to the, um, out to the, the ocean and recharging these watersheds, there are some municipalities that instead of discharging the water straight out into the ocean, they're now piping it to the beginning of a river system and letting it recharge the river. And that's almost a constant flow, recharging the river. Um, I don't want to speak to which river it was, but there, there is a one, at least, I thought it was Massapequa, but I could be wrong, uh, where it's a, a, a major river system where the water treatment is recharging the river. So that's, that's a pretty interesting concept. Us. First, I just want to say thank you for the presentation and thank you for those action plans. It's great to see everything um, kind of organized and so well thought out and then also for the, for the future of those, those plans. So thank you for that. You're welcome. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the Carmens, the upper Carmens. I was going to ask a damn question, but I won't. But if you could talk a little bit about the, um, the headwaters of the Carmens and Yapang. Yeah. Uh... It's not something I'm specialized in. The art flick chapter of TU, they're almost, that's their river. They're dedicated to that river. I know that they're working on um, reinstalling some wing dams, and, and we had talked about that's a multi-recreational river. You have kayakers, duck hunters, fishermen, um, hikers. So 
uh, there are a lot of stakeholders in that river, and it's a complicated river, I understand, from a morph morphological perspective. Um, but definitely uh, the headwaters, I really couldn't tell you very much about it. Um, it's out of my zone. But Art Flick to you, those are the experts, those are the people to reach out to, and they can, they will talk about the Carmens as long as you'll listen. <laughs> And thank you for that, for the uh, references to the website. I'm going to definitely look at that, the You're TV welcome. website. Thank you. Please do. Yes. Okay. Chris, are you going to be around for this morning? Yes. The, okay. So we're out of time for questions. So uh, thank you, and uh, we're going to get on to our next talk.